can light up the sky. Yeah. Hi. Oh, that's something. <laughs> hey, hey, welcome to the Floor You Podcast. This is Corona Free Entertainment for all of you that, that like to listen. I'm Paul Pleshek. I'm joined as usual by my 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 co-host and friend, Sonny Callahan. Sonny, how you doing? I am well, buddy. How you doing? Corona <laughs> free zone. <laughs> corona free. Well, not exactly corona free. There's a bunch in my fridge, I promise. <laughs> I have it's four the- children at home that we're, we are now homeschooling. How do you think it's going? Oh, God. Yeah, I got one. It's bad enough. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, it's all on iPads, and half the stuff don't work. We don't know squat about it, so we're trying to get logged into things. We're trying to figure out where they're supposed to go to get it done. I actually had an inspection yesterday, and my wife did the first day of homeschool training, and uh, when I got home... The teacher was drunk and the kids were suspended. So <laughs> you won't be leaving again, will you? <laughs> that looked good. Had one job today, but that canceled. So <laughs> obviously, I'm not complaining if somebody cancels. That's just uh, yeah part of the process here. No, there's been a there's been a lot of good memes and pictures and posts about this homeschooling over the last couple of days. So it's free entertainment, <laughs> and it's going to be. It'll be fine. It's just a challenge right now because we're trying to figure it all out. But the, the, new best normal. Part, the best part is we'll have four days in here on Friday, and we'll have a pretty good routine going. Next week is spring break. They'll have nothing. No. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, our spring break is in April, April 13th. April 13th. So I'm sure we won't be back. I don't think we'll be back at school by then. So. Well, there's some developments out there. France and another study in, at Stanford said that they've they've got 100% cure rates with a couple treatments, the same treatment actually, an old malaria treatment. So we'll see if that pans out in bigger samples and bigger studies. If it does, we'll yeah. pull out of this pretty quick. If it doesn't, God only knows where we end up. That'd be good because our goal is to go to Florida for spring break the week of the 13th and then me stay down there because the week of the 20th is our next AMI kids. So I'm hoping I don't have to reschedule that. So, uh, well, yeah, cause I'm sure that their campus will be quarantined. They won't let anybody on if it's still as close as those boys live. They're not letting anybody in there at this time. So, cause if one gets it, they're all going to get it. But then again, they're all young. You're all young men, 15 to 19, you know, they're not exactly in the danger zone for it, you know. No, but they're also in the custody of the state, so the state's going to say, nobody's suing us over this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, so but you yeah, had... I, no, I, I was going to say, let me, uh, on the 20th, the week that we're doing for AMI Kids, the reason we're able to do it was because of Graham Capabianco. So you probably know the last name, his father... Uh, Christopher Capabianco has been in the industry for a long time. And he actually was the guy who's responsible for the ASTM document we're going to talk about later today, uh, ASTM F710. But uh, I sent an email out. Graham responded. He goes, you know what? Uh, My company lit its flooring. We're going to team up with Novalis, and we're going to sponsor NAFCT's next AMI Kids. So that was – Awesome for him to do that, stand up of them, and I appreciate it. And without support like that, we couldn't go out here and help these kids. So I just want to make sure they get a good shout out. There, there's no question. And to see the industry start to step up with some of these opportunities is really uh, encouraging. To yep. you know, we we talk about it a lot. There's opportunities out there to expand the industry to get it to people that are in need of some direction. For some companies to step up and really yep. support us in those efforts is really encouraging. Yeah, this and and this, you know, I, I talk about it every show. This is one of my this is one of my favorite group of kids. They need the most help. So uh, the fact that we're able to do that and they're able to step up is just amazing for me. And I I appreciate it. Uh, so Kevin Phillips at Novalis and Graham Capabianco at Lit It's Flooring, formerly Capri Cork. You may know it under Capri Cork, but uh, a couple of great companies right there. That is fantastic. 
Now, you did get to uh, discuss that a little bit at FCICA, right? Yeah. So, so I think it's the last event in the industry was uh, Fakaika last week. We had just under 200 people. I think like 180 people. And um, um, it was in Nashville. We had a couple of good days of education, uh, a couple of good days of, of talking with people. And we, we promoted NAFCT quite a bit talking about the uh, opportunities that we could possibly have with the government training those kids. And uh, so it worked out really well. So we were happy to be out there, and it was a good time by all. So how'd that go? What'd they do? What'd they cover? FCICA, how was that, uh, how was that thanks, event? Thanks, way to call me out. Uh, missed some of the educational sessions. <laughs> <laughs> Ass hat. <laughs> if I knew what they were, I would have told you. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Show so, just went to PG-13, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as we don't get to R. Uh, no, we had some, uh, my wife and I had some uh, family um, uh, medical issues up there, so we were able to go see a family member who was having some surgery done while we were there. And uh, so I missed the first day a little bit, but um, we had some great product demos, Ardex demoed some new self-leveler, Sika uh, did a product demo of their new system that's um, uh, even with old adhesive. Let me see, make sure I get this right. Even with old adhesive residue on the floor, um, you can be on it mitigating and self-leveling and working on the floor in like five hours. So like these overnight jobs, that's just paramount. So that was a pretty cool demo. And I know both of those are competitors of mine, but when they got cool stuff, you got cool stuff. You got to talk about it. But uh, uh, Ardex had one. I think it had a three-hour, just the self-leveler. You could work on it in three hours. So it's always fun seeing those things. Uh, that's the main reason I go. Well, a lot of that, and we're going to talk more about it later, but a lot of that really comes down to whether you can use that by pre-qualifying the slab, right? Right. Don't you, exactly. I mean, you have to. Is it ready, or can you even go over that slab? And yeah. uh, you're right. That's one of the big things that's that's looked over because – a lot of installers think, okay, it had flooring in it before, so it can have flooring again. Well, that's not necessarily true. Maybe it may, may have been lucky that it passed. Maybe a completely different type of flooring system. May have been a breathable system before. Now you're putting plank on top of something that had broadleaf carpet for 25 years. That's going to mm -hmm. react differently. Or vice versa, which you know, would obviously be better. But, uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of qualifying factors that on the front end are being missed. And that's where this ASTM F710 document, I think going through that, we're not going to read the whole thing because that would put everyone to sleep. But I think if we touch on some of the key parts, you'll realize, oh, you know what? I've heard that from a manufacturer before. Oh, that's where that came from. Because you'll hear these same sentences over and over in adhesive manufacturers and underlayment manufacturers and mitigation manufacturers. We all pull the data from the same place. There's no need to rewrite the uh, reinvent the wheel, right? It's all right there. But uh, you'd be surprised. But, you know, I say this all the time. Whenever I'm in front of contractors, I always tell them there's three special tools they should have in their toolbox, right? Three special tools. ASTM F710. ASTM F1869 and ASTM F2170. If you don't have those three in your toolbox, you're doing yourself an injustice because you don't understand the game. You don't. Well, you can't. Game. You can't explain it either. So when you get on the job and you're trying to explain why you aren't able to put the floor in or you're not ready to prep the floor, if you don't have the references, if you can't pull those out and and really show someone, okay. This is the standard. This right. is what you have to live by. You're just trying to convince them with your words instead of pro providing evidence to what you're saying. Contract just contractor just thinks you're looking for an upcharge. You're trying to make a little bit of money. So, and it is an upcharge, a justifiable, fully fully necessary <laughs> upcharge. I mean, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You got to make sure you have it. So. So we've got some other things going on. Uh, National Wood Floor Association, they canceled their event. I think yeah, I think we all knew it was coming, but holding out for the best and just couldn't work out. It's a great I've show. Been, show. I've been looking forward to that being in Milwaukee since I heard it was going to be in Milwaukee. Yeah. About uh, 90 so minutes. So is, is it canceled or suspended? I don't know. Well, I think it's postponed at this point. 
but it's open ended. I, I don't think anybody is really saying that they're able to get. You know, you're you're looking now where you've got a large event, and now you have to find available space for it, and then you got to try to get everybody there that had plans for that time frame. Right. So, yeah, it's really one of those things that if they can get it redone, you know, um, same thing with the uh, ISCRC and the Standard Summit. That was canceled. ASTM Committee Week was canceled. That's in May, the end of May. Yeah, but some of these canceled earlier, I think, because there are certain points that you can get some uh, deposit money back or commitments back, so... Well, it's that close. in the case of ASTM, it, that's international. There really are a lot of folks coming from Asia, coming from Europe. Yeah. I, I can completely understand, for one, they, the travel ban's not listed. They won't be able to get here. But for two, why encourage that risk when, when you can just postpone it? So. Well, and, and hopefully, hopefully we get it under control. It hasn't gotten out of control like some countries here. So if we get it under control here... We're going to have to be careful about allowing other countries access until they're under control. So it's all going to be, it's definitely global and there's nothing we can do about it until, you know, we get to the point that everybody's comfortable that it's not going to kill 10% of the people it hits. Yep. Yeah. That's uh, it's a shame, but you know, it's the new normal got to deal with it. So I think, I think even more uh, restrictions are coming in the next few days only because they just want to nip it in the bud. Right, wrong, this, or indifferent, that's what they want to do. How come every time somebody says new normal, it's not a good thing? No. Oh, this is the new normal. We have more freedom. No, yeah. this, is the, this is the new normal. I have normal. more money. No. This is the no. new normal. We're always rich. <laughs> no, never a good thing when people say that. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, it's never good. Never good, new normal. <laughs> but uh, I, I, find it hard to believe some of the longer predictions are valid just because by the time you get some level of vaccination, you get some level of treatments that are available, awareness that's available. But I am by no means an expert, so, you know. Right. I'd say the actions taken are better than millions of people dying from something that we could have avoided, so whatever. Yeah. So... So anyway, we talked about the uh, we talked about AMI kids. We talked about FCICA a little bit. Talked about the fact that we're still surviving, but we wanted to talk some about F seven ten, right? So F seven ten, you know, something like that. Can't <laughs> see it. If you're listening to this on the radio on the podcast, uh, audio only, you didn't see that. Yeah. <laughs> But the F710 is the standard practice for preparing concrete floors to receive resilient flooring. I think this is a, one of the biggest ones simply because you are installing a vapor barrier on top of a concrete floor. You know, there's definitely a difference. You glue broad loom down to a concrete subfloor and you've got, it, it's permeable. You've got the ability to transmit moisture through it. So we go to resilient and a lot of people would say that this only applies to a glue down product, right? But this really applies to even floating materials. Because what do you get oh. between the flooring and subfloor? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry. I, I lost my uh, computer there for a second. But yeah, I totally agree. It applies to not only resilient, not only glue down resilient, but floating floors of all different types carpet, wood, laminate. Yeah. WPC, SBC, all that fun stuff. So yeah. All right. Sorry, I'm back. I'm back on track now. I got I'm easily distracted. <laughs> Squirrel. <laughs> Squirrel. <laughs> so, you know, the one thing that we wanted to talk about was or or one of the things we wanted to talk about was just just how important it really is and how versatile this document is. And I mentioned his name before, Christopher Capabianco. He's actually with um, Spartan Services now over in the Northeast. But he was the chair of the committee when it came up with this uh, document 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago. And uh, it's just amazing. We've been adding to it and trying to make it better. And um, 
it's still a, it's still a universal document. So there is going to be some ambiguity, some, you know, some generalized terms, but for the most part, it's something tangible that you can give your customer, your, be it a contractor, be it a homeowner, anything, and explain why you're doing what you're doing and why you can't do what they're asking you to do more than likely. So, and it, uh, it starts out, it, you know, the first thing, it starts out in nine different segments, right? So each segment has a very specific thing that it talks about. So you don't have to go through and read the entire document when you're looking for something. Um, you know, the first part is the scope. It kind of just gives an overview of what it talks about. Um, I mean, like, like 1.6, although carpet tiles, carpet, wood flooring, coatings, films, and paints are not specifically intended to be included in this category, resilient floor coverings, the procedures included in this practice may be useful for preparing concrete floors to receive such finishes. So it, it, there it is right there, it, you know, cause some people go, well, it's right in the name. It says resilient. But, uh, you know, it does pertain to other products. Well, especially when you're dealing with carpet tiles. Carpet tiles are pretty much just a resilient floor with a fuzzy face. And that's it. Right? I mean, exactly. And they better be treated that way for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, I think when we get into Section 4 of the general guidelines, I think it's one place that you take someone to. And really, 4.1, service the concrete to receive... <laughs> The surface of concrete floors <laughs> to receive resilient flooring shall be dry, clean, smooth, and structurally sound. Something we preached on the podcast constantly, something that we've uh, talked about a lot with substrates class. That's it. Yeah. You can go through the whole definition and the whole, I mean, the whole uh, document, but the rest of the document is pretty much just telling you how to get it dry, clean. Smooth and structurally Ooh. sound. Sound. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that easy. Dry, clean, smooth, and sound. So, yeah, and, and again, that's the first one under general guidelines. That's the most important sentence of the whole thing. Um, but if we move back up a little bit, I wanted to go over the, uh, I want to go over section two, the reference documents, because in this document, it talk, it, it references other great, um, 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 standards or or references that you can use when you're um, when you're going through this document has to do with concrete C109 um, testing of gypsum C472 again people we've told you if it's manufactured there's more than likely an ASTM standard that goes along with it so you know we were talking about this before we went on the air I can't believe this one's still here. It references D4263, test method for indicating moisture by in concrete by the plastic sheet method. All right, yeah. so next meeting, I will try to get that taken off, I promise. I had forgotten that was still in there, but that is just a joke. Please don't ever do that. It can give you false positives. It can give you false, false negatives. It can get you in a world of hurt. It's really not telling you much. Now, if it fails, it's, it may be more... The, the most I would say it tells you that if it fails that test, you absolutely have to do more testing. But if it passes that test, you absolutely have to do more testing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> put that. that was perfectly put. So. <laughs> so it accomplishes nothing. Basically. Yeah. Right, it's kind of like that, the meters, too, right? The meters aren't really telling you anything. Yeah. Not, well, as far as qualifying to install flooring on there or not. Well, there are some manufacturers who are recognizing that now, Paul. There, some some of the big ones are recognizing it, but you know the the benefit that I see with those meters is you know going around doing you know thirty, forty, fifty per thousand feet and figure out where you want to put your test kits. Where's sure. the worst case scenario? Um, but if you decide to just use relative humidity which by the way is a mistake. If you choose to do just one test, you can use the meter with the relative humidity. That'll give you a sense of what's coming to the surface. We, we I had an interjection at FCICA last week that uh, during someone's presentation about um, how many floors have failed because the relative humidity was too high. If anybody had any stats on that. The answer is zero, 
because no floor has ever failed because the relative humidity was too high. True. Yeah. It failed because moisture vapor emission moved to the surface. So if you have one test that tests moisture vapor emission and one test that tests RH, why would you just test, test RH? One of these tests by themselves mean nothing. You've got to do them both. You've got to understand what's what's moving on the highway, what's moving to the surface, and what's the traffic look like three inches below into this lab. But right? even at that, even at that, you go through your due diligence and you do all that testing. All of that, all of those data points are still only telling you what it's doing today. Yep. Yep. Well, let's see. Let's 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 talk about. Let's find this next one. Hang on. Hang on. Uh, can you guys hear me doing that? Uh, yeah, not annoying at all. Nah. No, what, what I was going to do on that follow-up point to what he just said is, even though it's right then and there, it's all a moot point if you don't have an intact vapor retarder underneath there. Because if you're doing testing and there's no vapor retarder underneath the slab, who cares what the moisture is? It's going to change whenever it rains. Well, whenever the water season, tape wet changes. Season, wet season, they, dry season. Who cares changed, what it is? Change their irrigation schedule, or they put in irrigation, or oh god. Yep. If if it's if it's older than twenty years old, plan on mitigating. I know nobody wants to hear that. I know no one wants to hear that. But that's not true. Even, People that do mitigation want to hear that. Want to hear that, right? <laughs> but even if there was a vapor barrier put in twenty years ago, which there was not, it's going to be decayed. <laughs> Right? It's going to be gone. It's going to be worthless. So, I mean, it's just a simple thing. And if you add it in the front end, it's so much easier than having to worry about it on the back end. Uh, agreed. I'm, I've said for a long time, I'm not sure why it's not just part of the prep at this point, simply because you well, have enough failures in the industry to say, you know what, it's part of the process. And you can't have a blanket statement to say do it all the time because dew point is an issue. And if you if you check for dew point and you're going to be okay, then that's one thing. But dew point is an issue that can come into play when you're on that non-pore surface and you get at that at the surface of the concrete, you could get dew point there. Well, of course, but you're talking about a completely different mechanism than vapor emissions. No, I know, I know, I know. But I'm just saying you, the. Um, I've, I've had long discussions with Peter Craig about this, and and he's the one who convinced me that that, that that's the only thing to consider is dew point at that point. But there are some, you know, examples of where that would be a mistake. I guess my point would be that whether you mitigate or not, then that's dew point, point, you still have to be concerned about dew point because it's a, oh, sure. a totally different topic. Right? Totally different topic. I agree. I agree. All right, let's move on. Let's... Uh, so that was 4.1 when we were talking about concrete floors, dry, clean, smooth, and sound. Easy enough. Uh, then it addresses cracks. It talks about expansion joints, isolation joints, or other moving joints. It defines what those are. You got to treat them differently, moving or non-moving. Um, you know, four point two. Not, oh, it's interesting on 4.2 with it that... Uh, such as expansion joints, isolation joints, or other moving joints in concrete shall not be filled with patching compound or covered with resilient flooring. Uh, contact the resilient flooring manufacturer regarding the use of an expansion joint covering system. You know, specifically saying if it's going to move, filling it's not really going to do a lot of good. Yep. Well, we, so we had, where was it? It was social media yesterday, day before. Someone asked, what do you charge to repair cracks in foundations? What? <laughs> Everybody's like, you're a flooring <laughs> guy. What are you talking about? And it was this. They were asking this. They were asking that. No one asked, is the crack in plane or out of plane? Because that's two totally different things that you would have to repair, right? Yeah. In plane, stick some epoxy in there. I used to drive cut nails in there, and that would kind of hold it stable and then put epoxy in it. And that would keep it as stable as it can be. You're not going to fix it, but that'd be as, give you your best chance. But if it's out of plane, run. Because once you say you're going to fix that floor, more is going to happen, chances are. Chances well, are more. 
if it's out of plane, one side's raising or the other side's falling. So yeah. how are you going to prevent that from returning or getting worse? They're just going to skim coat it and ramp it. <laughs> yeah, it'll never, it won't change. It's done changing. Skateboard ramp, you know, kids on their scooters, <laughs> you know. It's no. done changing at that point. It's not gonna. It's not gonna settle anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, check the crown molding and the drywall. I mean, my house is old enough to where it's it's sinking in the middle. I've got to get supports. Yeah, I'm saying it's probably sunk four inches, right? Okay. And maybe not even that. Maybe three inches. But in my kitchen on the wall, you can see from the ceiling down to the to the uh, the stud where the door goes. It's cracked. The drywall is cracked. It's yeah. It's more than one thing that's going to go wrong when it's something like that foundation for sure. When it's well, not sound. And we're not in concrete repair. We're not even in concrete. We're not even in <laughs> no. We are even when we're talking about mitigation, we're talking about we're not changing the concrete. We're putting something on it that'll reduce or stop the flow of moisture. Yeah. We're not altering the concrete in any way, shape, or form. We're just putting a cork on top. That's all. <laughs> I was I was talking, and I can't think of who it was. I think it was Joseph when we were doing the Ronald McDonald house. But he had a good point. He goes, flooring is the only finished trade that is asked to constantly fix other trades' problems. So if an electrician yeah, came cool. in and the plumber had put the pipe in the wrong place they would never ask that electrician to fix that pipe but that that pipes in the flooring they're going to ask the flooring guy to move that <laughs> damn pipe and put the flooring in right it's crazy how, how did we get to that point i went to a, a job just recently where a guy went to hang a huge mirror huge mirror it was like six feet long he went to put it on the wall and part of the remodel they added four feet to the wall and it was off by, by by the end of that four feet, it was off an inch. And that mirror is perfectly flat and perfectly straight. And he put it on the wall. He's like, there's nothing I could do with this. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't see a mirror guy pulling off the drywall. The, you know, the wall decorations yeah. guy pulling off the drywall, straightening the wall and hanging his mirror up. Yeah, exactly. Floor <laughs> tile guy, ceramic tile guy. Tear that shit out and make it straight. That's exactly if that was ceramic tile going in there, they would have that guy tear that off, which is yeah. which is a shame. It's something we gotta get to. We gotta we've gotta fix. So all right. We're so working on, we're, we're working on it, Sonny. We're, we're making we're, progress. We are working on it. We are working on it. So 4.4, 4.5. So concrete floor shall be smooth to prevent irregularities. Oh, looky here, look at 4.6 acclimation this is again this is one of those things that um <laughs> we could all tell war stories we had one i had one the other day that was shown to me it was out in california and they had like four pallets of material the person who told me the story listens i know and it was sitting outside <laughs> with a piece of cardboard over because it, it you know the instructions said not to be in direct sunlight <laughs> but it was outside it was outside, <laughs> and they were taking it from outside and installing it, and they were having gapping issues. Shocker! Really, really, we're acclimated it to the job site. Oh, oh, it didn't mean you didn't mean inside and under the same conditions. Yeah, the you, job site wasn't enclosed, so it didn't matter. It was... <laughs> yeah, exactly. It would have been the same. <laughs> Some of those things are just they're just killers. It, it's a simple thing too. I mean. It, just let it vinyl products let it acclimate for a couple of days where it's going to go 48 72 hours you'll save yourself a humongous headache hey we don't have the time to do that you got the time to replace it because well, it only takes one exactly. it only takes one ten thousand square foot job to bite you and it, it i've seen it put people out of business for it, something it as, is, as acclimation it is thermodynamic and you have equations for pvc pipe you have equations for steel doesn't matter what the construction product is, they have equations for thermal dynamics and how they have to leave room for it to move and, and to change. Flooring's not going to be any different. If it's no. hot, it's going to be bigger, and if it's cool, it's going to be smaller, and that's it. Um, I, I always wonder why it's even a question, but, you know, 
it always I, comes down. Got to get it done. Got to get it done. Got to get it yeah, done. I, I just don't understand what people think they're saving by skipping that portion of it. Yeah. Because, you know, it's going to come up in the claims process or complaint process. Did you acclimate it? And yeah. there, you know, the dealer is going to say, yeah, or the contractor is going to say, yeah, they're going to go in and talk to the homeowner. No, they took it right off the truck and started installing. Well, I don't even, I go down and I measure the, the space that's there for the plank. And if the space for the plank is bigger than the plank supposed to be, there you go. And it was bigger yeah. when it was put in. Kind of, you know? kind of can't can't mess that one up. That's uh, that's science. <laughs> science. <laughs> All blinded me with science. <laughs> so five one here. Now that's, this is something that's we scared haven't my talked. dogs. They're barking. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't talked about testing procedures yet. Yeah, uh, yeah we have. But it says that the first line in 5.1, all concrete slabs shall be tested for moisture regardless of age or grade level. Right. Now, shall in these standards, one of the things with shall, that is the word. That is the ultimate. Two words in that one. All and shall. Yes. That all leaves shall. no debate. When you're working in standards... Shall is the equivalent of you damn well better. That's right. <laughs> I mean, that's there's there's should, which mm -hmm. is really close to shall. Should yeah. is should, almost almost should, a shall. Could maybe when you see you a shall in, when you see a shall in a standard, there's no it. discussion. Everybody that worked on that standard said, Yeah, you gotta. You gotta do it. <laughs> yeah, right. And that's what's great about this document. It's not just adhesive manufacturers, underlayment, no. mitigation manufacturers, resilient flooring manufacturers. They make carpet, carpet tile manufacturers. Installers and we all agree. You do what? Installers serve on this. People came and, out of installation. Installers, serve. inspectors, we all agreed. All concrete slabs shall be tested, regardless of age or grade level. Uh, it's above grade. It's on the 30th floor. Still have an issue. Because if there's no place for that moisture to go and it was capped early, there's still moisture in there, right? Well, what about if that building was exposed and it was a high a high humidity environment and moisture was driven into that slab? Now you yep. cover it up with a resilient floor uh, and you put a vapor barrier on top. Now you've got trapped moisture. What are you going to do? That slab was under was at dew point several times during remodeling. <laughs> you got yes. a wet slab, right? There's, there's sources of moisture other than rain that affect a slab after new normal dude, dude really you, we just told him it's a corona free podcast that's right that's <laughs> free. i test myself <laughs> oh we're at r <laughs> we, we have lost control uh-oh <laughs> yeah <his> protection <laughs> But it talks a lot about testing methods and talking to the manufacturer or looking at the manufacturer requirements. It doesn't really lay out that you have to do this one or that one or this one and that one. Most of the direction is, yeah, you have to test it, but the exact specifications of what tests you have to do or how far in the testing you have to go, that comes from the manufacturer. 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 I think it's interesting. The next paragraph to 511 has got a table that uh, certainly needs to be updated. It says table one ASTM test methods for concrete moisture reading. So again, ASTM doesn't give the limitations. It gives guidelines or it gives suggestions. It says F1869, three pounds per thousand square feet per 24 hours and 2170. 75 percent when when is the last time you've seen a slab that had either one of those two much less both of those two so that certainly you know it's not it's not astm's duty to change that that's just a reference that's what it was for 20 years but um you know you'll be hard pressed to do 1869 correctly and get a three pound reading we're closer to 85 uh, percent on the uh 2170 now aren't we more standard more just yeah it's 80 percent five pounds is, is 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 pretty much base grade low end stuff that's that's about as low as i see we got oh, a whole god. new 5.2 oh god a... oh god can we just skip this part 5.2 <laughs> 5.2 yeah we're not going too deep into this we have a 
It's fuck testing. <laughs> fuck testing. <laughs> oh, I mean uh, pH. <laughs> pH testing. Uh, Boy, if you got a pH problem, though, you. Oh, I shouldn't say this. If you got a pH issue, you probably got a moisture issue. I mean, where else is the pH coming from? False. False. Where's the <laughs> pH coming from? Well, depends on which way the pH went. It could be low and be a curing compound or come some kind of sealer on the floor, or it could be high, and then you got the alkali salt, and that's pro- that is a function you know, of you're, moisture. You're dead on, because I was only thinking high. I was only thinking high with it. You're right. If you've got a low reading. I like how you're surprised when you say that. Oh, you know what? That dumbass was right. But it is. But that's that's the big fight that we've got with pH testing. We're trying to create a standalone. I shouldn't say that. We are. It's it's coming. I don't know if it's going to pass, but it's coming. A standalone pH test standard. I think it'll be a test method. I don't think it's a standard test method. And a lot of us just think it should be used forensically after the fact. But then the counter argument to that is, well, what if it's new construction and you're looking to see if there's some kind of curing compound still on the substrate? At that point, it's a valid test. But it, it's, it's kind of like the MAT test in a sense because you're not – just because it would pass the pH test doesn't automatically mean you don't have any sort of curing compounds on the surface. I mean, how many well, tests would you have to do to see how widespread it is? I think That's... it's eight for the first thousand feet of what they're doing. Um, but again, it just depends. I can make any pH test you want be 12 or higher. Sure, right? scrape the surface. Just scrape the surface. So, you know, the, the, the word that we battled back and forth on was clean substrate, clean concrete substrate. Define clean. There is no definition of clean. So kind of where we left it was do the pH testing on the concrete the way you're going to install over it. So sweep the floor, you know, scrape up any drywall, whatever you're going to do, however you're going to go over it, be it underlayment or flooring or adhesive and flooring, that's how you test. You know, don't sand anything off. Just get it clean. To me, that's that's a pretty good representation of what it's going to be, because um, you can't even do a water droplet test for curing compounds anymore because they're still trialing everything. It could be it can be as non-porous as this desk and still not have a curing compound on it. You know, yes. You walk into these things and it looks like your it looks like your iPhone. You're looking down; it's a black screen. It looks like they're going to put something on there if it was clean, I should say. But uh, that that's the challenge. So. The bottom line is, and I'll, I stole this line from Larry Press. He said at one time in ASTM, an FO6 committee, he said, and I agree 100%, I have never told someone not to do an installation because the pH was off. Never. Not one. Not one off time. Off low? Off low? Never off, even off, off high? high? Not with intolerance. Below 7 or above 10 or 11 or whatever now. They're crazy. 7 to 11. Or nine to eleven, excuse me, sevens. Uh, well, you can't. One of the one of the reasons I could understand that is because you really don't have any pH unless you have water, right? So if you've got residue on the surface, you add water to it. Now you can get a pH reading. You created. Not you've moisture, created the alkalinity. Yeah, that wasn't there before. <laughs> but then it, you you sure as heck had better be right about the vapor emissions and, and propensity for it in the slab because any amount of condensation at that point is going to give you a problem. That's right. Do your moisture tests. Do both types of moisture tests. If your moisture tests are in check, your pH will be fine. And God forbid, if you if you get something and you got a funky pH, a low, something below 7, some kind of contaminant on there or a acid, somebody acid washed it or something, just take a cool, clean sponge, just cold water. You don't have to put any other chemicals in it and wipe the floor down with that clean sponge and then retest it. Chances are you're going to get rid of whatever was on there because it doesn't take much. I hear people say, use this type of acid, use this, do that. You don't. Just use cool, clean water, and that'll take care of just about anything with you know acidic residue on the surface. Well, it would at least dilute it enough. If it was a low concentration, it would dilute it enough that it wouldn't uh, be an issue. Wouldn't be an issue. 
Right. Uh, Plus your floor is going to be clean. But I think your point with a sponge versus if you're going to clean a floor versus flooding would be, again, adding moisture to it to try to rinse that slab. Minimize minimize the water exposure to it, for sure. For sure. Well, I think we covered that. I don't think too many people will leave us nasty messages on YouTube for our coverage of pH. If you test for pH, no. <laughs> Making all sorts. Of, I think we've uh, we've muddied the waters enough that they can't pin us down on any one statement, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> just, just make sure your moisture tests are in check and do both kinds. Both. That's so important. I, that's just so important. All right, section six. We're burning through this thing. Preparation of new concrete floors. So it breaks it down into new or existing floors. So this is new concrete floors. New slabs should be properly cured and dried. Uh-oh, did I lose you? No, I'm here. Properly cured and dried. Something popped up on my screen. Drying times, drying times for slab moisture testing will vary depending on atmospheric condition and mix design. Right? So a slab in Florida is going to dry a lot slower than a slab in Arizona, right? Yeah. Yeah. Technically speaking, if it's normal weather conditions. Normal. (laughs) But if you do have moisture in that Arizona slab, we don't have moisture out here. Guess how much faster it's going to be coming out of the slab in Arizona, which can cause the problem. So that's where people get confused. Oh, Arizona doesn't have moisture. Well, if it's in that slab, it's trying to reach equilibrium. So it's flying out of that slab. Yeah. So you got to be careful on timing with that, for sure. I'm going to apologize. If you hear doorbell going here and stuff, kids are home. We're Uh, going to go in and out. I I, I was going to say I heard something earlier. I was like, what the? That's all right. My wife's sitting by the pool. It's like 75 degrees. She's sending me pictures. I'm like, I can't go out there. <laughs> well, I'm there. They've been pretty good, but uh, I'm not going to try to uh, have a sound studio quality silence during these things. <laughs> so I apologize. You're again, not you're getting your what you're paying for. Not with your four. They're in ripe playing age. There'd be no way to hold them back. So no. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Going back outside again. That's all right. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> so so we went through that. I think the idea with the new slab, I mean, there's other issues in, in Arizona as well, right? So now you've got a hot slab and you've got cool air up above it. That's going to make moisture want to move different than when you've got cool ground underneath it and, yep. and warm air above it. You know, it changes, you know, when you've got cool air above a hot slab, condensation and dew point is is something you don't even think about, but absolutely comes into play yeah so it, it's all about equilibrium in that slab you can have 99 percent relative humidity in a slab and not ever have a problem if that's what that slab equilibrates to yeah that's the argument that i give with people who just do rh testing you can also have a slab that has 80 percent rh but has a massive drive of moisture vapor emission to the surface and you can have a failure at 80 percent so if you can have a failure at 80% and not one at 99%, that right there tells you that doing one test is not good enough. And that's the same for calcium chloride as well. You can't just do that. I'm not slamming the the the, um, the RH guys by any means. You've got to do the calcium chloride RH. you got to know them both. got to do them both. Really, some of these for wood floors, and it's off the, off the topic a little bit. But you've now got for seventy five bucks these RH and temperature monitors that you can put into a, a building, and oh, just yeah. forget it's there. Yeah, boy, seventy five bucks a job is, isn't isn't yeah. that much when you're considering the liability, and if you can prove how that building was. And you, was you dealers and you installers out there, when you're working in somebody's house, you know which ones are going to give you trouble, <laughs> and you're like, oh, excuse me, ma'am, I got to stop. What? Yeah, Karen, I got to go to the store and get some data loggers and put it in your floor because Karen is going to give you a hard time. <laughs> Her name's always Karen. I, you know, it's, it's always Karen. I don't know. That's it. <laughs> just, just like the yuppie guys always used to be Chad. Chad. <laughs> Chad. <laughs> so for seventy-five bucks, yeah, go do it. It's the it's the best money you'll ever spend. 
Um, but I, in my opinion, I think that should come from the flooring contractor or the dealer because they're the ones carrying the warranty, not the installer to go out there and buy that. So just to clarify that. Heck, I'd, I'd say anybody that really wants to cover their backside. Yeah. Well, this, at this the is end true. of the day. If the, if the job is big enough, then and justify yeah. it to do it for sure. But the, the next one, 6.2, that's the one that we we alluded to earlier. It's the installation of a permanent below slab vapor retarder, not barrier, retarder meeting the minimum performance requirements of, guess what? There's an ASTM standard for it, E1745, E1745. So it talks about the permeance, the permeability rating, the thickness of it. It's all in there. So just putting a sheet of visqueen underneath there doesn't always get it. Um, well, so, well, calling that a barrier, doesn't that give it some ability to let water flow through it out if you get water on top of it? Or no, nope. that? Well, I think barrier means it just completely stops it. Right. This is right. retarder. So it's the the permeability is not zero. It's point zero zero. Is it six? No, it's a six mil point zero zero one. I think is what it is. I think that's the barrier though. Well, either way. So yeah. retarder does allow some vapor to pass through, but that can be in either direction at that point. Right. So mm, I lost you. I was trying to see if I can pull it up, but I can't pull it up while we're doing this. But oh well. So we'll move on to the next one. Preparation of an existing concrete floors. But I do like this because it, you know, a new slab and a and and one that's got floor covering on it is it needs to be treated completely different. You know, there's different things that you need to look out for. Um, an existing slab, how are you going to know if there's a vapor retarder underneath there? You're going to ask Karen? Karen's not going to know. <laughs> 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 Bitch, I paid you to know. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think when you go into even some of the removal of old, uh, old resilient floor, adhesive residue, paint, surface contaminants, I mean... Uh, if your resilient floor paint or adhesive residue is to be removed, follow 7.1, 7.12. It goes into asbestos. And, and Yeah, I was going to say 7.11 is the most important part of the difference between existing and new construction. So this is the, and I think this is important enough to read, uh, not the whole thing, obviously, but it's RFCI's warning. It says, do not sand, dry, sweep, or dry sweep, dry scrape, drill, saw, bead blast, or mechanically chip or pulverize, Existing resilient flooring, backing, lining, felt, paint, asphaltic cutback adhesives or other adhesives. Why? Because they may contain asbestos. If it's black or you even suspect it minutely, get it tested. You can send it to a lab. What is it, Paul? What's a test? I haven't had bucks. one done in 10 years. Huh? I think it's 100 bucks. 100 bucks. Under 100 bucks. Uh, save you from a massive lawsuit. So. Well, and and don't forget that it brings up paint, and it goes on 7.1.2. Certain paints may contain lead, exposure to the lead dust. So we're not just talking about asbestos anymore. We're talking about right. lead. You know, that doesn't even get us to silica. I mean, uh, no, lead well, lead is big. I mean, if if they have they have a, a a very specific window of when houses were painted especially porches and add-ons. And if it's got lead, they can come get you. I mean, they really can. You've got to be really careful in these remodels. Well, if you read that last sentence, it talks about uh, identify lead-based paints, removing such paint, any licensing, certification, and training requirements for person performing lead abatement work. We're right in the same area as asbestos at that point. You have to be right. trained and certified, licensed. Depending you got to wear a local... corona mask, a corona oh, suit. That's... <laughs> hey there's some, there's some job security while you're out walking around with <laughs> corona ppe on you could do some uh asbestos abatement <laughs> talk about new normals lead is less dangerous than air <laughs> <laughs> breaking news wow <laughs> uh, <laughs> But yeah, so but it does go into also. It's kind of like the uh, the concrete vapor testing, the responsibility of the installer to find out if it was taken care of. It's not the responsibility of the installer to do it per se, right? The white paper that came out how long well, ago? It, well, it depends on the contract. Contracts for commercial work, 
may say it's their responsibility. You know, true. It just depends. True. Uh, it will, but yeah, it's industry it's wise. Industry wise, yeah, yeah. So I and I think I've shared this stat. This this not it's not a stat because it's not confirmed. But I, this conversation I had with uh, Howard Kinnear, and he said at one time he tell, thought tell the people about that. I gotta step. But I gotta go grab something real quick. Okay, you do that. I'll just tell I'll keep people. fluffing for a while. So um, I had a conversation one time with Howard Kinnear talking about calcium chloride tests, and this was five six years ago, maybe even longer than that. And to his point, he thought 80% of all calcium chloride tests were done incorrectly. And I told him I completely disagreed with that. I thought the number was much higher. I think the number is in the 90s, 95%, because there are only a few people who continue to do the test, who continue to do the test for one, who, but who do the test correctly. That means going in there, uh, if it's an existing floor, taking the flooring up, grinding the area, letting it sit for 24 hours before you put the test kit down, then making sure that, um, you know, you start the test when you're supposed to make it go. As a, damn, that was harder than I thought it was going to be. I had to <laughs> fluff for like 30 seconds. He's back now, guys. <laughs> Y'all have to listen to me do it. He's anymore. Huh? I'm going to have to go back and listen to that part just to see how you did. <laughs> it's, it was weird because I'm sitting there talking to nobody. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's like doing a webinar, so those, that's challenging. Oh, but to, to, to finish my point, you know, to, to make sure you, if you're going to do a calcium chloride test or a relative humidity test, you've got to make sure you do it correctly. And each test has their own challenge. You know, relative humidity has a challenge of slab thickness. I think I've shared that picture um, that I that uh, I saw from a base in i won't say what state but the challenge was this was i don't know for for those of you watching hopefully you can see this um but this was one slab that was the same floor and how do you determine that slab when they vary an inch and a half two inches do you still have those what, what he's showing there I don't have the cores. I've got the pictures we took at the essentials. Okay. But what he's showing here is five different core samples that all vary in depth, depth of slab. And the tallest to the shortest is probably an inch, inch and a half difference. So, <laughs> holy cow. You got, a, you got a text from your wife there while you were holding <laughs> the phone up. Is that what you're... I told you she's by the pool. I'm sure glad it didn't come up. <laughs> She would have killed me. Oh. <laughs> oh. So you. we're we're coming up on our hour. I think that if we I think we've outlined the fact that F seven ten, the most recent one is F seven ten nineteen, which means it was redone in twenty nineteen. Uh to have that available to review, to discuss, to back up your your assertions when you're trying to to Explain tell somebody them. that this lab's not ready, I think that that's a, a completely yeah. valuable tool. Well, and the last thing I do before we sign off here is after the last section, which is section nine keywords, which just doesn't really mean a whole lot, but there is an appendices here, and it talks about concrete composition and practices. There's a lot of good information about concrete in this appendices um, and there's also it talks about um, um, a synopsis of other method of evaluating moisture conditions of concrete floors to receive resilient flooring formerly contained in e1907 so there's even more information talking about a matte bond test goes into more detail about the sheet test and then lastly it talks about um, the effects of moisture and how it can affect the flooring, the adhesive, the underlayment, the whole nine yards, which we all know what it can do. That's why we're sitting here talking about it. So great piece of information. Again, $75 for a year, you get access to whatever your category is, FO6. You get access to all those documents for the year. You can get a digital library. You can get a book. Um, you can get it. I think do they still do the, CD. I don't know if anybody does that anymore. I haven't seen the CD. 
but I, that's how I used to get it in like the 2000s. But you can get those, that information and it's yours to keep while you're a member. If you try to buy these separately, they're anywhere from $45 to $100, depending on which one you want. So, well, $5 membership. And uh, keep ASTM going to make sure we have things like this to, to share with you guys. Yeah. I want to thank everybody for listening. I think it's time to, to wrap her up here. Um, don't forget, it's on YouTube. Not that we're much to look at. Well, you're not. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we're on YouTube. Shout out Preferred Flooring. Now we'll see if he's listening, right? See if you listen to the end. Uh, Daniel's my shout out. Let's see. Daniel's a shout out. So his brother Jose was at FCICA last week. So I got to spend a lot of time with him. Great. God, what a great family. I love that whole family. Both brothers and the sister. They're good people. I, I couldn't believe how much Daniel told us how much he, Daniel said he taught his brother everything. No, Jose said he taught Daniel everything. Oh, or you're saying, yeah. Or did Daniel say that in Aliquippa? <laughs> I was trying to cause trouble there. Thanks a lot, Sonny. My bad. <laughs> so you can reach either one of us. You know, you can email us, Sonny at NAFCT, Paul at NAFCT. I think those are the best ones to get us at. We have emails for the podcast, too. But, heck, this is turning into a uh, uh, a regular conversation about some of the things NAFCT is doing anyway. So, you can yep, reach yep. us there. Um, we have floorupodcast.com, nafct.com. I'll be linking the podcast right on nafct.com. You can see our newly certified uh, 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 heat well flash cove techs. Oh, NFC very nice. Fight are listed on the NAFCT website. So, All right. Do you want to put the uh, flooring essential teaser out there? Ooh. Uh, yeah, let's see who listens to the end. Let's see who listens to the end. So. We are in the early staging, planning stages of another Flooring Essentials class. This one will be a little bit different. It'll be a three-day event with a trade show mixed in the middle of it. And it will be in Grapevine, Texas. So that same hotel, the courtyard where we had the very first one three years ago now, I guess it is. Um we're still trying to confirm the dates, but it's going to be in September after all this craziness has gone away. And uh, as soon as we have more information, we'll certainly be talking about it here and sending emails out to everybody. It's going to, it's going to give us some idea of who listened to the end. Both people will say they're Both not people. Going. Both people will say they're not going. Another one of my brother's songs that he wrote. Another one. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We appreciate it. We'll try to get one out again next week. Maybe four next week. Heck, if yeah, we, we make it a couple in next week. Bye, everybody. Bye. She makes the moon shine. Every night when she makes the moon shine. We parked the car behind the barn, feeling our way through the dark. By the creek in the shade.